from Scottish moors to African swamps. A story of missionary life in Uganda. By C. J. L. London, G. Morris, 20 Paternoster Square, E. C. Chapter 1. A Missionary Exhibition. Not very long ago what was called, a missionary exhibition, was held in one of the largest buildings in London, for the three weeks during which it remained open it was visited every weekday by numbers of people. Grown-up people were there in crowds, but there was also a fair sprinkling of boys and girls, who took an intelligent interest in what they saw. And really wanted to learn all they could about the dark places of the earth. They will not, I think, soon forget the delightful stories, told by more than one missionary. Of the people among whom he or she, for more than one lady missionary told us about Chinese women or Indian schoolgirls, had been seeking to make known the sweet story of salvation through the precious blood of Christ. What was to be seen? I am afraid that if I were to try to write down the names of all the articles exhibited you would not think the first chapter of, From Scottish Moors to African Swamps, an interesting one, and might not even care to read the second, so I will only name two or three. In the Indian court, some very beautiful shawls were shown, made by native workmen. A loom, so simple and almost clumsy that it was not easy to believe that stuffs so varied in design and rich in colour could have been woven upon it, was also shown. Carved work in ivory, and chains and necklets of Indian gold met the eye at every turn, but from all the forms of beauty and blaze of colour many turned sadly away to look at the idols, of which quite a number were on view. Some were large, others small, all were ugly, and some almost shapeless, and yet these senseless idols are feared by millions of men, women and children, many of whom obey the same laws as ourselves. In another court, bright with Chinese fans, lanterns and umbrellas, a medical missionary, at home on furlough, was telling how sick people are often treated in China. They cannot have a good time, and often have to suffer a great deal of needless pain. A native doctor has no need to learn much about different kinds of illnesses, their cause and cure, he will not be required to walk the hospitals. His stock in trade usually consists of one or two books. Some packets of herbs, a bundle of charms and a few large, dirty needles. Chinese doctors are, as a rule, very fond of using these needles, but as they take no trouble to keep them clean, the use often not only causes severe pain, but leaves worse trouble than the doctor at first attempted to cure. A poor woman who was quite blind had, the doctor said, been brought to the mission hospital where he had worked, and to which he hoped very soon to return. She had been suffering from bad headaches, causing great pain in her eyes. She was taken by her friends to a native doctor, who said he must prick her eyes to let the pain out. He did so, in such a way that her sight was destroyed, and for the rest of her life she was hopelessly blind. When a sick person goes to a Chinese doctor, who usually wears a long, loose coat, something like a dressing gown, made of green or plum-colored silk, very large spectacles and has his fingernails sometimes from two to three inches in length, carefully protected by small coverings of bamboo, the doctor opens a box about two feet in length, mumbles a charm over it, and after in a very solemn manner opening it, tells the patient to take one from a number of small bamboo canes, on each of which a number is given, and the sick man pays his fee, and goes away quite satisfied with the care bestowed upon him. A peep at the far north would be interesting, but we must not linger among the snow huts in which the Esquimo live and sleep. They take long journeys in sledges drawn by reindeer or dogs and have very clever ways of catching seals and fish. The brave little band of missionaries who live and work in these cold countries often have to endure great hardships and as mail steamers only visit some of the ports once a year. We may be sure that their opportunities of getting home letters and new books are few and far between. But I have not told you anything about the African exhibits, and we shall find them of more than common interest. Day after day groups, varying from 10 to 12 and 50 to 60, gathered round a printing press. Was there anything remarkable about it? I think not. It was old-fashioned, a trifle clumsy, and had few, if any, of the improvements that of late years have done so much to perfect the art of printing and yet the hearts of Christian. Men and women were deeply moved as they read on a card the simple but touching story of how on that very press. In far-off Uganda, in the very heart of heathen Africa, the first scripture portions ever seen in that dark land had been printed. Who took the press there? Alexander Mackay, who will long be remembered as the pioneer missionary of Uganda. 
The story of his useful and unselfish life is a deeply interesting one, and if in thought we follow step by step the way in which he was fitted for his life work among African swamps, we shall, I hope, learn some lessons of patience, courage and simple trust in God. His life story, written by his sister, lies before me as I write, and from it we learn that on a dull, Cheerless day in the autumn of the year 1849 there was rejoicing in a Scottish home over the arrival of a baby boy. The father, a godly, well-informed man, who preached every Lord's Day in the neighbouring church, or kirk, as he would have called it, and when not visiting among his poor or sick neighbours spent much time in his study, decided that the little stranger should be named Alexander. The father looked with a strange blending of pride and tenderness on his firstborn, and when his eyes turned from the face of the unconscious infant, they rested upon a picture that always hung just above his writing table. It was that of a man somewhat past middle life, whose strongly marked and almost rugged features told their own tale alike of suffering and resolution. It was that of John Knox, the Scottish reformer, whose fearless preaching had kept a purer faith than that of Rome alive in many of his countrymen and women. God bless the wee laddie, said the father, and grant that he may grow up to love and serve his maker as John Knox did, who never feared to preach the faith of his fathers before priests, and did not quail before the scepter of a queen. If he be like his mother he'll have a gentler spirit and a softer heart than that good man had. Though I doubt not that he was raised up by God to meet the need of the times he lived in, sir, was the reply of Annie McWilliam. The old housekeeper who had lived for many years in the family, and like most upper servants in those days stood on very friendly terms with her employers. Chapter 2. A Scotch Laddie. Alexander Mackay did not walk out of the pages of a storybook to enter upon his life work in Uganda. He was a real boy, fond of fun, ramble and adventure, but also gifted with rare powers of observation and a quiet thoughtfulness beyond his years. Surrounded from infancy by the influences of a godly home, he was early taught the way of salvation. Naturally warm-hearted and affectionate, that wee laddie, soon became a general favourite, not only in his home circle, but with the simple country folk who lived near his highland home, and who, even not more than forty or fifty years ago, clung to their old habits and ways of life in a manner we may not find it easy to understand. They would often walk from five to six miles to attend the preaching, and the same distance to return to their scattered homes. Neither rain, snow nor storm kept them away, and to make their homeward way seem shorter than it really was, they used to form little companies, telling each other all they could remember of what they had heard. While the children were encouraged, not only to answer, but to ask questions. Many of the women wore no bonnets, only high-crowned white caps, the wives and daughters of farmers being known by their closely fitting bonnets, made of cardboard covered with black silk. When one was worn out, it was replaced by another of exactly the same pattern. Each carried her Bible, neatly tied up in a large, white pocket handkerchief, with a sprig of some sweet-scented plant, while the other hand held the family umbrella, usually a green cotton one. For however bright the morning, a scotch mist, or drizzling rain might come on at any time. Perhaps, next to his parents, there was no one the boy loved better than his kind and faithful nurse, Annie McWilliam, or, as she was more often called in the house and parish. Old Annie. Age had bent her form and silvered her hair, but she was true and godly, and loved her young charge dearly. One among the stories told of Mackay's childhood is that as on an ironing day he watched Annie deftly smoothing snowy linen and dainty lace, he suddenly exclaimed, Annie, you like to look nice. Why don't you smooth the creases out of your neck, and iron the wrinkles out of your brow? Annie stopped in her work for a moment, but her only answer was, if tea's fine on the morrow. We'll gang to Blackfell's farm for a day or two. Oh, that will be delightful, the boy replied, clapping his hands, but tell me, Annie, what made you look so sad just now? It's because you didna ken me when I was young. I'm glad I didna, for then you would not have been old Annie. And you could not have told me half the things I want to know, was the boy's answer. The following morning was all that could be wished, so after an early dinner the two set out for the farm, fully six miles away. Both were good walkers, and long before sunset had received a warm welcome from the farmer and his wife, who were old friends of Annie's, having known her in her young days. Their long walk had sharpened their appetites. 
and they were quite ready to do justice to the homemade bread and butter and new laid eggs with plenty of fresh milk set before them tea drinking having in those days hardly found its way into highland homes after sundown as the evenings were chilly the party drew round the cheerful fire built of pine logs that blazed and crackled merrily the wide chimney was open to the sky while from the rafters near hams and flitches of bacon were in process of curing the farmer and his sons went out to attend to the cattle and the women plied their knitting needles Annie and her friend talked over old times, and told stories of the Covenanters, of their sufferings for their faith, and of the hardships and dangers they so often had to face. Forbidden by unjust and cruel laws to worship God according to their own consciences, enlightened as many of them had been by the teaching of the Bible, they had found comfort and help in secret gatherings. Often after nightfall, and always in lonely, out-of-the-way places, often in woods or caves. But even this was not allowed them, and if, as was sometimes the case, the time and place of these secret assemblies became known to their ever-watchful enemies. A party of Claverhouse's soldiers would be sent to surprise them, and any who were unable to escape were hurried away to prison. Some were sentenced to death for no other crime than reading their Bibles and meeting for prayer and praise with others who thought and felt as they did, while others dragged out long and weary years of imprisonment. To such stories the boy would listen with great attention, and when overcome by the excitement and fatigue of the day he could no longer keep his eyes open and was sent to bed. The two friends talked to each other of the look that had made that bright young face so grave and thoughtful, and said, May the good Lord bless and keep Sandy, his household name. For surely some great work lies before the wee laddie. And they were right, but before he could enter upon it, many and varied lessons had to be learned, not only from school books but in the battlefield of life. Alexander Mackay did not attend a day school till he was 14, up to that age he was taught by his father, who took great pains with his education. Gaelic was at the time of which I am writing largely spoken by the simple country people among whom Mackay's boyhood was spent, but from his early childhood he spoke English with ease and correctness. And his father took care that he should be well grounded in Latin and mathematics. Many outdoor lessons, remembered in later years, were learnt as father and son made collections of flowers, ferns and mosses, or watched the ways of birds and insects. But perhaps his mother, a woman of gentle spirit and deep piety, had no small part in moulding the character of her boy. Christian missions had a large place in her thoughts and prayers, and she would often tell her son stories of perils from robbers, floods and wild beasts, that had been so bravely faced by African explorers and missionaries. Sunday evenings Mrs. Mackay usually spent with her children, her husband having gone to preach at some distance. Bible verses committed to memory during the week were repeated, and if the lesson had been well learned the reward was a missionary story. Chapter 3. A Mother's Influence. Alexander Mackay was a merry-hearted, fun-loving boy. Few things gave him greater pleasure than a long ramble across the moorlands. Sometimes stopping to watch the flight of a flock of grouse or wild ducks the noise of his approach had startled from their hiding place among the heather, at others he would stop to gather some rare fern. To be carefully dried and pressed on his return home. From his father he had learned to observe, so found never failing interest in studying the ways of birds and insects. Being a good walker, he was often his chosen companion in the visits that from time to time he paid to people who attended his preaching, but who lived in outlying, often faraway places. During those walks many a never-to-be-forgotten lesson on natural history or botany was given and received, for Mr. Mackay had read and studied much. And his son was early taught to trace the goodness and wisdom of God told out in his care even for the smallest and weakest things he has created. Often father and son would repeat together, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Rev. 4.11. 4. After an interval of silence, they would sing such words as The Lord my pasture shall prepare, and feed me with a shepherd's care, my noonday walks he shall attend, and all my midnight hours defend. And their voices would awaken many an answering echo in the surrounding hills, hills the boy dearly loved to climb. We almost wonder if, as he scaled their rugged heights, he ever thought of himself as one day to cross African swamps, or as climbing mountains to which the heights on which he then stood were mere molehills in comparison. 
we do not know, so we will not venture to guess what his daydreams were, but we are sure of one thing. That Alexander Mackay was being even then shaped and molded by God to fit the niche he was one day to occupy. His early training was just what he needed to fit him for his life work as a pioneer missionary in Uganda. But you must not think that he was allowed to run wild, or that he was an idle, careless boy. Naturally thoughtful and fond of study, his lessons were almost without exception well and thoroughly learned. Several hours each day were spent in his father's study, where sometimes he read aloud, at others committed to memory large portions from books selected by his father. As he grew older he sometimes helped by copying moors, answering letters, and other things. In all such work great neatness and accuracy was required of him. To his mother, whom he loved with all the devotion of which a deep, strong nature is capable. He doubtless owed much of the missionary spirit that in after years led him to leave his loved home circle and his native land. To help carry the gospel to one of the darkest of the dark places of the earth, Uganda, which at that time was wholly heathen. Mrs. Mackay was descended from an old Huguenot family, and would often tell her children how, after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, they were obliged either to escape from France, or attend the Mass. They chose the former and after many hardships and dangers reached the coast, and finally settled in Scotland. Their property, and much of their worldly goods, had been left in France, but like the Hebrew believers to whom Paul wrote. They were enabled to take joyfully the spoiling of the goods, for in Scotland they were free to read their Bibles in broad daylight, and worship God according to the teachings of that blessed book. These stories made a lifelong impression upon the boy, but Sunday evenings in the old manse were rich in holy, happy memories to all the younger members of the Mackay household. For when the verses of scripture learned during the week had been correctly repeated, mother was always ready either to read aloud from some interesting book, or to have what her children loved to call, a missionary talk. Let us take a peep at the little group one Lord's Day evening. It is a winter's night, rain and sleet beat against the closed window shutters, and the wind moans and howls outside. Inside all is warmth and brightness. The mother and children are seated round a cheerful fire, lessons are over, and Alexander claps his hands and cries joyfully, Now, mother, we are all ready for a story. Please, do you remember the one I told you last week? Oh yes, mother, it was about Henry Martin, and his work in India, and I can say the verse of the missionary poem you taught us. Light on the Hindu shed. For the maddening idle train, the flame of the sati is dire and red, and the fakir moans with pain, and the dying faint on the cheerless bed. By the Ganges laved in vain. And what Indian custom is referred to by the word sati? That of burning a widow alive with the dead body of her husband. You told us, too, that when more than 70 years ago a great part of India came under British rule, laws were made to punish those who attempted it. There was only too good reason to fear that in out-of-the-way places, or where there were few if any British officers, it was still carried on, though not so openly as before. But, mother, will you tell us tonight a story from the very beginning, when did you first begin to think about missions? I was quite a little girl, not more than 11 or 12 years old. When I heard there was to be a missionary address in the church I attended with my parents. I did not expect there would be anything said that I should find very interesting, but I knew the gentleman who was going to speak. He was a friend of my father's and often came to our house, he loved children, so I felt I must listen to every word he said. I had even heard that he had a great wish to go to the heathen, but had been prevented. I shall never forget that night. The church was very full, we went early to get a front seat, as my father's hearing was not good. Two short verses of scripture were read, Jesus said, If ye love me, keep my commandments, and go ye therefore, and teach all nations, and as the address went on, I felt as I had never felt before. Child though I was, I felt sure that I loved my Saviour, and so much was said about the honour and happiness of being a missionary, and seeking to bring souls to Christ. That I longed to be old enough to go and teach little black children about Jesus. At the close, prayer was offered that some among his hearers might be constrained by the love of Christ to go, and that others, who perhaps could not go, might by prayer and gifts help to send others. That night I could not sleep. I got up very early, dressed, put on my sunbonnet, and went out into the garden. It was a lovely June morning, roses were everywhere. I went into a quiet spot, and kneeling down, asked God to let me help the missionaries. If I could not go, even a little girl could, I knew, pray, and perhaps when I was older he would show me some other way in which I could help. 
from that day to this my love for, and interest in, missions has never died down. Chapter 4. A Boy's Request. Would you like me to go as a missionary to Africa, Mother? If God prepares you for it, my boy, but not unless. You may be a true missionary, and yet stay at home, you must first come to him, and if he has need of you in Africa, he will call you in a way you will not mistake. Should the message, depart, for I will send thee far hence, ever come to you, take care that you do not disobey it. Remember what Jonah got for his pains. It was in the quiet hour, Mrs. Mackay and her children loved so well that the boy listened to his mother's words, the impression they made upon him was deep enough to influence his whole afterlife. Every now and then business of importance rendered it necessary for Mr. Mackay to leave his highland home and visit Edinburgh. In the spring of 1859, when Alexander had not passed his tenth birthday, father and son were on their way to the railway station, where Mr. Mackay was to take the train for the great city. He was driving, his son accompanying him in order to take home the trap, kindly lent by a neighbouring farmer. They had gone more than halfway when Mr. Mackay broke a silence which had lasted some minutes by saying, Sandy, what book would you like me to bring you from Edinburgh? This was the opportunity the boy had been longing for, he could not afford to lose it. Though he was by no means sure that his request would be granted. I think, father, if it would not cost too much, I should very much like to have a printing press. Mr. Mackay dropped the reins for a moment, then said in a voice of mingled surprise and displeasure. A printing press. Whatever can you want with a printing press? What you have to do is to become a good scholar, be that, and then if you ever write anything worth reading, anyone will print it for you. Why, only last week when I called upon Mr. Smith at Keg I found one of his sons lying on the study floor, poring over a great Hebrew Bible. And you talk of wasting your time over a printing press. But, father, do you really think it would be wasting time? I have often heard you say that skill takes up no room in the pocket or travelling bag, and some day I may find it very useful to know how to print. My dear boy, do you not know that the desire of my heart for you is to see you one day become a preacher of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ? Yes, father. But Martin Luther said that printing was the latest and greatest gift by which God enables his servants to advance the tidings of the gospel. The railway whistle was heard, Mr. McKay's train was due. And with a hasty goodbye at the station, father and son parted. Alexander watched till his father was out of sight, then drove carefully home. As the train bore Mr. Mackay along, he thought over his son's request. A printing press. What could have put such a thing into the boy's head? I expect it is the part printing played in furthering the work of the Reformation. I know he has been reading Dorbinet lately. He does not play like other boys, but devours every book he can get hold of, yet every now and then he seems hankering after some kind of manual work. When he has a free hour, if he is not in the study with a book, I find he goes down to the carpenter's shop, handling all kinds of tools, and now and then lending a helping hand. I think the best thing will be to send him to school. In the meantime, I must look for a book that will make him forget the printing press. A few days later Mr. Mackay entered the well-known publishing firm of Messrs. Blackwood. New books in every variety of style and binding there certainly were in plenty, and yet he could not find exactly what he wanted. He was a well-known visitor and always welcome, and was soon engaged in friendly chat with the head of the firm. Before they parted, he spoke of his son's desire for a printing press, to which Mr. Blackwood laughingly replied, he wants a printing press, does he? Well, my dear sir, there is no need to worry yourself about it. Let him have one. We cannot all be on the same lines. I believe that boy means to strike out a course of his own. Give him a free hand, and he will come out all right in the end. You get the press, and it will give us pleasure to make him a present of the type. But tell him, that even if he prints your books, we do not give leave to publish them. So the printing press was bought, and in due time, with a large and varied collection of types packed and sent off. No words can tell the delight with which it was received by its young owner. For some weeks every spare moment was devoted to making himself thoroughly acquainted with every part of his new possession. At first he found considerable difficulty in getting good, clear impressions, but he kept on trying, and in time was able to produce really creditable work. 
how little anyone thought that one day, in the very heart of darkest Africa, upon that press the first portions of scripture that were to bring light. Peace and joy to many of the sons and daughters of Uganda were to be printed. We can only say that in that quiet Scottish home God in his love and wisdom was preparing the future workmen for his work. Chapter 5. First Thoughts of Africa. Up to 60 or 70 years ago very little seems to have been known about Central Africa. I remember, when quite a little girl, having read in an old geography book that the greater part of that vast continent, lying nearest to the equator, was supposed to be only a sandy desert. With here and there pools of water, round which a few native huts, in shape very much like beehives, were clustered. In some very old maps of Africa a great river has been traced, but as no one appeared to be quite sure of it being there at all, it was often left out altogether. Several explorers had tried to trace the river Nile to its source, and about the time that Alexander Mackay was making his first attempts at printing. A great deal of attention and interest had been aroused by hearing of wonderful discoveries. Yes, the old maps were, after all, right. The Congo, a mighty river, was really there, also lakes. Uganda was not a barren waste, but a well-watered and well-peopled country. Every new discovery formed a fresh subject of conversation in the boy's home. And few things gave him greater pleasure than to trace the journeys of Livingston and Stanley on the map that were no longer required in his father's study, he carried off in triumph to his own room. Father, said Alexander one day, there is one thing that puzzles me very often. I know that till quite recent times, when any skilled work such as building bridges, piers or lighthouses had to be done. We had to send across the channel for engineers and they had to bring their own workmen with them. Have we had to send for missionaries too? Livingston and Moffat were, I know, Scotchmen, but I see that quite a number of the missionaries in Africa are Germans. Well, my boy, was his father's reply, you see the field is so large and so many stations needed to be filled, that it was difficult to find a sufficient number of really suitable men at home who were willing to be despised, unknown missionaries, and a large missionary institution at Baal. In Switzerland, responded nobly to the call for the foreign field. But, father, why did you say, despised missionaries? I have always thought it was a great honor to be a missionary. So it is, to those who are constrained by the love of Christ to carry the glad tidings to heathen lands. But any who have not that constraint had better stay at home. Soon after this conversation, the boy confided to his father his great desire to become an engineer. Mr. Mackay, who had long noticed his son's growing love for mechanics, was not surprised, though his own hopes and plans for the future of the boy had been quite different. He heard him patiently, and explained kindly that to place him as a pupil with a good firm in Glasgow or Edinburgh would cost a large sum of money, much more than he could afford. He advised him to go on with his studies, and when old enough, try to win a good scholarship that would carry him through the university, and in wearing college cap and gown he would, he told him, forget all about saws and hammers. In the spring of 1860, when, Sandy, as he was still called in the home circle was just entering his eleventh year, he seemed to lose his robust health and high spirits. His lessons were, as a rule, well and faithfully learned, but it was easy to see that his heart was no longer in them. He did not complain, but grew thin and pale, he lost his appetite, and his parents grew anxious. He was seen by a doctor, who owned he could not tell what ailed the laddie. His father took him to Edinburgh to consult a physician, who gave as his opinion he was not really ill, but had grown beyond his strength, and advised change of air and a long holiday. Acting at once upon the advice of the doctor, his father took him for a tour in the Highlands. In later years he often recalled the happy, restful time he enjoyed during those weeks, especially when a friend lent him a strong Shetland pony and he was able to take long rides over the moors and get delightful glimpses of lake and mountain scenery. Three months of free, out-of-door life did him good in more ways than one, and he returned to his home greatly improved in health. But though he did his utmost to please his father by attention to his studies, his old love of books seemed almost a thing of the past. He was still gentle and thoughtful, and very kind to the younger members of the family, but he never seemed more happy than when engaged in some kind of manual labor. It was, Sandy, who shoveled and swept the snow that often lay in deep drifts blocking the way, and almost preventing visits to or from neighbors. 
he would clear and weed the garden paths, and sowing and reaping time always found him ready and willing to lend a helping hand. Small repairs, requiring the use of carpenter's tools, soon began to be looked upon by the family as his work, and he rather enjoyed, than otherwise, taking a turn at wood chopping. And so the years, happy, busy years, passed on till the boy was fourteen, and his parents felt it was high time he should be sent to school. Much prayer about it was made by both, for kind and amiable as he naturally was, they were not sure that he had really decided for Christ, and they feared that his affectionate, confiding disposition might, in the wider world of schoolboy life, expose him to temptations he would be unable to resist. He had never had a boy companion, and looked forward with great delight to a promised visit, during the holidays, from a youth of about his own age, the son of an old friend of his father's who, like himself, was about to enter the grammar school at Aberdeen. On the appointed day, John Hector, who in after years went as a missionary to Calcutta, arrived at the manse, and the two lads soon found that they had much in common, and, as the parents of both had hoped, a warm friendship grew up between them. They were left pretty much to themselves, and took long and delightful rambles, sometimes visiting a neighbouring lock or waterfall, at others fishing or bathing in some mountain stream. Chapter 6. School Life and Business Training. School life was the turning of a fresh page in the lesson book of men and things to Alexander Mackay, but he took to it kindly. His home training had formed habits of thoroughness and industry, and even before his conversion, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, Eccles, 9. 10, seems to have been the motto of his life. He did not lose his love of machinery, and took a lively interest in all the buildings in course of erection in the neighbourhood. He still studied well, and if ever he felt himself tempted to be idle or careless, the thought of how disappointed and grieved his loved ones at home, most of all his mother. Would he if he failed in his examinations, or his report proved anything but satisfactory, spurred him on to renewed diligence. He was a day pupil at the grammar school, and during his first half year formed one of the family circle in the house of an old friend of his father's. For several reasons, however, it was thought best that lodgings should be found for him, and to satisfy herself that he was comfortably placed his mother undertook a journey to Aberdeen. For some months Mrs. Mackay had been far from well, and her doctor advised her not to go till the weather was warmer. But to think of herself, her own health or comfort, when others were to be helped or served, would have been unlike her gentle, unselfish disposition. So she went, and the memory of the ten days mother and son spent in the great city was one that, to the close of his life, Mackay loved to recall. It was holiday time, so that he was her companion in her walks and visits to places of interest. How little he thought, when he saw her off at the railway station, that the end of her journey was so very near. A chill, taken on her homeward journey, proved too much for a frame already weakened, and three weeks later the boy received a hasty summons home as his mother was dangerously ill. He remained with her a week, and, as she appeared much better, returned to school, but she had not strength to rally, and a few weeks later calmly fell asleep in Christ. Her death was his first great sorrow, and as he stood by her grave, he felt as if he never could be a light-hearted, fun-loving boy again. He was not with his mother when her home call came, but her dying charge, tell Sandy not only to read, but to search his Bible. And to meet me in heaven, faithfully repeated to him by a relative, was never forgotten, and proved a turning point in his life. Religious knowledge, godly training, were not all, he saw clearly enough. He must have to do with Christ as a trusted, personal saviour. He took his place before God as a lost sinner, and that he was, on the Lord's side, was well known among his friends and schoolfellows from that time. He still had a great wish to become an engineer, a wish that for some years his father did not feel free to encourage. Writing to a friend in 1866, he said, I cannot see my way for the future, but I feel certain that the Lord will make it plain in his own time. I believe that God gives each of us some talent that we are bound to turn to the best possible account, therefore I must go on with engineering. You say it is impossible, as my father cannot afford to give me the help I should require. But if I cannot overcome a greater obstacle than that of my father not being a rich man, I shall never make a good engineer, therefore I must go on with engineering. For he who gave me the desire will in some way grant it. This I feel sure of and in ways that perhaps he did not expect the way was made plain. In 1867 the family removed to Edinburgh. 
the six years that followed were very busy ones. Time was, he felt, very precious, and hardly a moment was wasted. Two of these years were spent as a student in a training college for teachers. Afterwards, he took a course of study in engineering and other subjects at the university. And that he might get a practical knowledge of the different kinds of work he might one day find himself required to do or to superintend, he worked for a time in the well-known firm of Messrs. Miller and Herbert. During the greater part of the time, in addition to his other work, he taught for three hours, almost daily, either in public or private schools. And in this way earned money enough to pay his class fees and personal expenses. One of his most valued friends was Dr. Horatius Boner, the author of the well-known hymns, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say, and I Was a Wandering Sheep. The close personal friendship and counsel of this ripe and mature Christian were an unspeakable help and comfort to the younger, and deepened his desire really and truly to serve his Lord and Master. School and college life lay behind him, and as he was just entering his 25th year Alexander Mackay took passage on board the S.S. North Star, for Hamburg. He had a twofold object in going. Having already made some progress in the German language, he wished to perfect himself in it, and some things connected with the profession he had chosen could, he felt sure, be more thoroughly learnt in Germany than in London or Edinburgh. It was soon after the Franco-German War, and trade was very dull. However, he soon obtained employment in a large firm. It was just the kind of work he liked, and he put his whole might into it, but he sorely missed his Christian friends. Many among his workmates were openly freethinkers, and by hard questions, and clever, though unsound arguments, did their utmost to shake his faith. Indeed, he wrote to his sister, if it were not for daily Bible reading, and that every time I open the word of God I get a fresh ray of light. I think I should give way altogether. The Lord is very pitiful, and of tender mercy, and before many weeks had passed he had found in Dr. and Mrs. Bauer just the friends he so greatly needed. They did not speak much English, and his German was at that time far from being fluent, but they loved the same precious Saviour, and had much in common. Come and see us whenever you like, you will always find a welcome, said the doctor, as with a warm handshake he bade Mackay goodbye at the close of almost his first visit. Always frank and open, he spoke out his desire not only to visit but to live with his newly found friends, adding that, surrounded as he was, not only at his work, but in his lodgings, by infidels. He longed for a quiet Christian home. So he was received into their family. Dr. and Mrs. Bauer soon learned to love him almost as if he had been their own son, and found him a useful and trusted helper in the home mission work in which they were actively engaged. Chapter 7. A long journey The employers of Alexander Mackay soon found that, in addition to more than common talent, he was industrious and persevering. And several very important pieces of work were left almost entirely in his hands. Still he did not allow his weekday duties to occupy his whole time and thoughts. Remembering that he was not his own, but had been bought with a price, the precious blood of Christ, he really and truly desired to serve his Lord and Master. His Lord's days and evenings were either spent in Bible study, happy, helpful intercourse with Christian friends, or visits to the sick and poor. One bitterly cold night in the winter of 1875 he finished reading a book in which he had grown deeply interested, How I Found Livingston. It was at that time quite a new book. Written by the well-known African explorer, Henry Stanley, who tells in its pages how he and his men, in their search for the pioneer missionary. Dr. Livingston, who had not for a very long time been heard of by his friends in Scotland or England, had crossed rivers, climbed mountains, and for days and even weeks together forced their way through forests where the trees grew so closely together that though the sun was shining brightly overhead they had sometimes, even at noonday, almost to grope their way. As he read, all his old interest in and love for Africa seemed to revive. He lingered for a few moments over its last page, then closed the book. As he laid it down, his eye fell upon a packet of books and papers sent from his home in Scotland. Hardly knowing why, he took one up and read with delight, not unmixed with surprise, an appeal for Christian men who wished to devote their lives to the Lord's work to go as missionaries to Uganda. In the very heart of Africa, its then king, Mtesa, being, it was said, quite willing to receive and welcome them. 
it was already past midnight, but Mackay felt he could not sleep until the first step had been taken, and a letter offering himself for Uganda was at once written. Some correspondence followed, after which he paid a short visit to London. Early in the new year he received a letter telling him that he had been accepted, and asking him to get ready for a voyage to Zanzibar as soon as possible. Just at that time he was more than usually busy with work for the firm by which he was employed. He had invented a machine in which a great number of different parts had not only to be made, but fitted together, and he did not feel free to leave until the whole was in proper working order. However, he replied that he hoped to be ready to sail about the last week in March. But a great domestic sorrow, the sudden death of a younger brother, a bright, noble boy to whom he was greatly attached, prevented his going so soon. He did not sail till towards the end of April. How glad he must have been when fairly out at sea. The three or four weeks before his departure had been such busy ones, that the friends who bade him goodbye at Southampton thought he looked very worn and weary. What a number of packing cases he had seen labelled, Zanzibar, and lowered into the hold of the ship. The contents of these cases were very varied. All kinds of tools, several machines, presents for Imtessa and other native sultans and chiefs through whose dominions the missionary party would have to pass before reaching Uganda, and bales of cloth and bags of beads. The two latter to be used as money in the purchase of food and other things that might be required, coins being quite unknown in that part of Africa to which they were going. A medicine chest and some books had not been forgotten. On the voyage to Zanzibar the party met a merchant who had known the missionary, Dr. Livingston. He had done business with him and been impressed by his fair dealing and kindness. He did not speak very good English, but when asked what he thought of the doctor, replied, Livingston very good man, yes, very good man, Livingston the best man I ever have seen, good for rich man. Good for poor man, good for every man. For the first time in his life Mackay had an opportunity of seeing something of the horrors of the slave trade. A British man of war and several gunboats did good work against the Dows. During one week no less than 150 poor slaves who had been stolen from their homes and sold to Portuguese or Arab traders were set free and helped to return to their villages. The boats and men are, he wrote home, all too few for the work required. It is like catching a few of the stolen horses after the stable door has been left open. To tell of all the difficulties, dangers and disappointments of the journey from the coast to Uganda would make the story far too long. Day by day, and hour by hour, ye have need of patience, seemed to be saying itself over and over again. But the lesson was by no means easy to learn. A good deal of time had to be wasted in getting the different parts of their boat, the daisy, out of the custom house. Part of a valuable engine had been lost and was never heard of again. There was difficulty, too, in getting porters to carry the boat and other heavy baggage up country. The friends at the French mission station gave him all the help they could, but so many broken articles had to be repaired. And so much, blacksmiths and carpenters' work had to be done before the party was ready to start, that sometimes it seemed as if they would never start for Uganda. Black men, however heavily loaded, always sing at their work. One day Mackay got a number of natives to carry the boat, ten men to each piece, for some distance, and as they tugged and pulled and groaned under heavy burdens, they chanted. White man give plenty pence. They thought themselves well paid when each man received the value of tuppence for a couple of hours hard work. A page from his notebook will give some idea of how busy his days were. Got up at daylight. Coffee, oranges and quinine at 6 a.m. weighing goods, packing them into bales of 60 pound. Each, till 7. At 7 sound the drum and take out my men for drill, 8 o'clock till 10, busy packing. Hard work at any number of things till lunch, then at work till dark. Numbers of visits from natives of different tribes, all good at looking on, but have no desire to help. After dark, dinner, then at work again. So far it has been hard times for most of us, physically and mentally. The daisy, had been built in three sections for transport by land to Lake Nyanza. But as they were found much too heavy to be carried any great distance, Mackay set to work to take out screws and rivets so as to divide it into small pieces which could be carried by two men. This, of course, took some days of hard and seemingly fruitless work, but after delays and much trouble in getting porters, they were at last ready to start. Tools, books, machinery, valuable instruments and many other things were to be carried by native porters, of whom, after considerable trouble and many delays, Mackay succeeded in engaging about 200. 
his home letters and journals show that he felt it was no easy task he had undertaken. He wrote, suddenly to have stepped into the place of father to so large a family of children, who are every day crying out pos ho, which may be translated. Give us our daily bread, is by no means an easy task. All their little disputes and complaints I have to settle. My interpreter is very poor in English, so he often misunderstands, and makes fresh trouble by doing so. Still we get on wonderfully well, and it often comes to my mind, if 200 men on march can give such endless trouble. What an anxious time Moses must have had all through the long years of the wilderness journey. It is a great comfort and help to remember that hour by hour we can commit our way to the Lord and he will give all needed wisdom and grace for guiding. Overstrain, alike of mind and body, brought on frequent attacks of fever, and at times Mackay was so weakened as to be quite unable to walk, and needed to be helped to mount his donkey. Still, there was very little sickness among his men, for which he was very thankful. Chapter 8. Fever and Famine. As days and weeks went on, the work of the pioneer missionaries to Uganda seemed to grow more, instead of less, trying and difficult. The daisy, stores, and many other things, all had to be carried for hundreds of miles on the shoulders of men, and he found himself obliged to take the command of a caravan of more than 200. Very often the road lay through marshes, where they were forced to wade knee-deep through stagnant water, quite unfit for drinking, and even when boiled and filtered still dirty and ill-smelling. Repeated attacks of swamp fever left him so weak that some days he was too ill to travel at all, and more than once he thought himself dying. But his work in Africa was not done, and through the mercy of God he recovered. Smallpox broke out among his men, and though he used all the means in his power to prevent its spread, several of his native porters died. Writing to his sister, he said, it would have shocked an English doctor to have seen my donkey boy, almost covered from head to foot with smallpox sores. Wading for a couple of days through the swamps with very little clothing on, but here he is today, quite well, and with hardly a mark upon him. Most of his provisions were either lost or stolen and sometimes the whole party knew what it was to be short of food. It was no uncommon thing for a porter to throw down his load and run away, and when they came near a native town, or even a cluster of mud huts, the chief, or headman, never failed to expect and demand large presents in the way of cloth, salt and beads. Soon after passing in Tamburu, Mackay was seized with such a severe attack of fever that in his already weak state he could scarcely bear even to be carried in a hammock. His companions decided that he must return to the coast, but he was with difficulty persuaded to do so. Mackay at last consented, and set off eastwards, carried by two strong men, and eight others with his tent, clothes and other things on their shoulders. With this small party a rapid journey to the coast was made, and there a sea voyage in the mission steamer, Highland Lassie, did his health good. When he was again fit for work be set about collecting another caravan for the relief of his companions on the Nyanza intending to go with it in order to join the party he had accompanied in the autumn. Porters were more difficult to obtain than when the previous caravan had started, so he made a tour of 300 miles northward and back along the coast to collect men. Often he and the few men who were still with him had to wade for hours across swamps where they were waist deep in mud and water, sleeping in the open air or in cow sheds, and living on roots, berries, or anything they could get. Before setting out again for Uganda, Mackay received instructions to try, if possible, to construct a road, the first ever made in Central Africa. And though a severe attack of fever forced him to be idle for six weeks he was soon at work collecting men and tools. The Sultan of Zanzibar seemed much pleased at the proposal, and gave Mackay a fine horse to ride on. By May Day the work was fairly begun, and to his great delight he was able to engage as his personal servant and interpreter Susie, an old servant of Dr. Livingstone's. One of the faithful few who helped to carry his body to the coast, and afterwards went with his remains to England. He could speak several native languages, and proved a real help and comfort to the lonely missionary. The slave trade was still a cause of great trouble and anxiety to Mackay. He writes, how many poor slaves are being nightly driven to the coast no man can tell. A well-beaten track leads from here to the sea, and every time I cross it, I shudder to think of the unhappy men, of the helpless women and children who, after being stolen from their homes, 
are being driven along it to be crowded into the hold of slave dows. A British man of war, for the suppression of the trade, was stationed off the coast, but its boats and men were too few for the work that needed to be done. The Sultan could, he said, do nothing to prevent the slave trade, and Mackay soon found that the native interpreters, who were engaged to help the British sailors, were often bribed by the slave traders to allow the dows to pass unnoticed, or to say that the women on board those captured were the wives or household servants of the owners. Still he kept bravely on, and his home letters were bright and cheerful. Here is one, I am well again, thank God, and camp life has set my spirits up. My horse, my dog, my goat, my oxen and donkey, with my household of nearly 70 men and a few women, are enough to feed, and quite enough to look after at one time. It is now dark and all is quiet, my men are going to rest. I have given them their food, and they know I shall take a good day's work out of them tomorrow. The insects are hard at it again, midges, flies and mosquitoes above, and ants and other creeping things below. A cup does duty for my inkstand, with a little powder mixed with water for ink, but eight or nine o'clock is bedtime when one is on the march or in camp, and I must turn in. So good night. Day by day the work went on, miles of forest and jungle had to be cut through, trees felled, and river banks sloped down. Herds of elephants roamed through the jungle, and tracks of the lion and panther were often seen. Camp fires had often to be kept burning all night, but the party were preserved from the attacks of wild beasts, and in rather less than 12 months 230 miles of road were completed. The business of road making over, Mackay was once more free to set out for his beloved Uganda, though it was still 600 miles away. He was advised to travel by bullock cart, and to his great delight found a young Englishman, an earnest Christian, and by trade a carpenter, had been sent out to help him. His new companion proved of great use in improving or repairing the native carts, and as his strength had not, like Mackay's, been wasted by frequent attacks of fever, he was able to manage the wilder oxen. At last they started, six large carts loaded, 80 oxen, 60 men, half of whom were drivers, the rest porters, five donkeys, a flock of sheep and goats, with six dogs, made up the party. But every day the carts upset, sometimes two or three times, and in some places the jungle was so thick that it was found that twenty oxen yoked to one cart were hardly able to draw it. Chapter 9. On the March. I almost seem to hear some of my young friends saying our last chapter was not a very bright one. And it made him feel quite sad to read of the difficulties and dangers Alexander Mackay and his friends had to face in their attempt to carry the gospel to the then darkest part of dark Africa. Well, dear ones, if I only told you of the bright and pleasant things, and left out all the trials of faith and lessons of patience that had to be learnt by the way, I should expect you to say my story was not a true one, and then you would not care for it. Frequent attacks of fever thinned their numbers, and the few who survived were weak and often suffered greatly. Crossing rivers was often no easy matter, and in a letter written to friends in the homeland, Mackay tells of one that must have needed not only all the nerve and courage he possessed, but much real confidence in God. He wrote, I have just arrived at the Rukigura River. It is at present in flood, a mighty, rushing river, neck deep. How I am to cross it I cannot tell. By putting up ropes and pulleys, much in the same way as for the life-saving apparatus in shipwreck is done, I think I could manage to get the men and most of the stores over. But eighty oxen, the carts, and several donkeys will, I am afraid, prove slow and troublesome work. Still, I must make the attempt, or stay where I am till the flood is past, and I cannot tell how long that may be, as we are having thunderstorms with heavy rains day after day. A few of my men have run away, taking cloth and other things with them, those still with me are, I think, on the whole, fairly faithful. They are all sad cowards, and when any danger arises take to their heels, leaving their master to get out of it the best way he can. Just now a scorpion, one of a kind much feared by the natives, as its bite is almost always fatal, crawled over me as I sat writing. It would make you shudder to see half the horrors of this kind one meets every day. Snakes glide about in the soft, slimy mud through which we have, often knee-deep, to wade. Several kinds of flies draw blood with every bite, and they can bite too. Last night I was quietly sleeping when the growl of a hyena just at my ear made me start up, seize my rifle, and fire, but Bobby, my dog, was before me. 
and set up such a lively bark that the hyena was off before I had time to present it with a bullet. Heavy rains had made deep ruts. Large felled trees and bushes often lay right across the road, and the rough, uneven path was so wet and slippery that one other of the carts seemed almost always in trouble. Sometimes the pole ox would fall and upset the cart. It must have been trying to find, as was often the case, that everything breakable was broken, and nearly everything that could be spoiled was so. But Mackay was not a man given to crying over spilled milk, so the cart was reloaded, and making the best of what could not be helped, they were soon again on the march. About this time an accident rendered him lame, and for more than a week he was unable to walk. While helping to get one of the carts out of a rut, a bush caught his foot and he fell, the wheel going twice over his leg. Two of his men put their loads into a cart and carried him in a light hammock, but as cart after cart upset, they did not make very good progress. And weary and almost fainting from pain and loss of blood, the day's march ended, and they reached a village. The chief, hearing of his arrival, brought six or seven sick people to be treated, and one little boy he wished to be cured of spinal disease. Weak and worn out as he was, the sad news that reached him while still some distance from Uganda, must have added greatly to his sorrow and anxiety. There had been fighting in a district through which they still had to pass, and two white men and about fifty natives had been killed. He did not need to ask who the white men were. Too well he knew that two of his missionary friends, with whom he had sailed from England, Messrs. Smith and O'Neill, were the only Englishmen within many miles, and he felt their loss deeply. Soon after he wrote, there were eight of us sent out, two soon found they could not stand the climate and had to return broken down in health, four have gone home, only two are now left. Poor Africa, but the work of God will proceed, even if we break down. The next stage of the journey lay through a plain 36 miles in length. He was only taking a few of his men, carrying small loads he was unwilling to leave behind, and as he knew robbers were often to be met with he ordered them to keep close to each other. Towards evening of the first day, one of them fell a few yards behind, when a party of robbers sprang from their hiding place, and striking the hapless man a heavy blow with a club, seized his load and disappeared. To attempt to follow them would, he felt, be worse than useless, but the contents of the stolen load could ill be spared. All the food supplies on which he depended for several days were gone, also his candles and matches. Perhaps the loss that tried him most was that of two ounces of quinine, a medicine he had found very useful in keeping off attacks of fever. The robbers were hardly out of sight when a caravan drove up. The leader was an Arab trader, who was crossing the plain in a very comfortable way. He had a nice large tent with Persian carpets, cooking utensils, sweets, coffee, plenty of rice, and many other things. He behaved in a most friendly manner to Mackay, and gave him a good dinner of rice and curried fowl, and before saying goodbye made him a valuable present. A packet of candles and a box of matches. He had no quinine, so the next day Mackay sent back one of his men a distance of 30 miles with a note, begging that the precious powder might be sent to him with as little delay as possible. Chapter 10. Fresh Trials. Writing to his sister in June 1878, Mackay says, What a forlorn hope our mission to Uganda seems to be. I am almost the only one still living of the missionary band who sailed from Southampton little more than two years ago. Very few could endure the hardships we went through in the early months of this year. The loss of so many valued friends and fellow laborers is a great grief to me. But God's ways are not our ways. I am now in some thirty miles of desert, and am going, D.V., to the island of Ukarewe, to see the king who so lately murdered Lieutenant Smith and O'Neill. I have just had a bad turn of sun fever, but am quite well now. Elephants, hippos, giraffes and zebras were frequently seen in the desert. After an evening march Mackay and his porters arrived just before nightfall at a deserted village. They were all very tired, but having found water, lighted a fire, cooked some potatoes and nuts, and lay down to sleep. Mosquitoes, however, were very troublesome, and about ten o'clock an alarm was raised. Loud reports as of guns were heard, and flames seen in the direction from which the sounds came only increased the alarm. The men made up their minds to be off at once. They left their pots, goods and half-cooked food all lying about, and packing his clothes and other belongings in less time than they had ever required before, by the very terror forced their leader into getting up. 
though he was at first very unwilling to do so. There was no moon, and the night was dark and cloudy. On they went, tripping, slipping and stumbling at almost every step, till, after a two hours' march, they reached another village, where the people were friendly. Their next day's march brought them to a third village, where the cattle lived and slept in the same huts as their owners. The men wore no clothes at all, and little girls and young women only a small apron made of beads. His socks were all worn out, and Mackay suffered greatly from blistered and often bleeding feet, when marching across sandy deserts or through brushwood. A few days later he caught the first glimpse of the lake, and enjoyed the refreshing breeze that cooled his sunburned cheeks. On the shore of the lake lay the mission boat, the daisy, overgrown with grass, and very much the worse for its long rest. The machinery, too, was in a very bad state, and many valuable tools lying about were either broken or so injured by rust as to be useless. Soon after he had a message from the king, who seemed to be greatly in fear of the white man, and said he had no quarrel with the murdered missionaries, and that the slave traders were the only persons to blame for the death. One or two extracts from his notebook at this time are interesting. I have, he wrote, sorted and assorted machinery, nails, screws, etc., till quite done up, and much has still to be done. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day, and I cannot tell you how gladly I shall welcome its rest. May I have grace to use it aright. The morrow brought him an early visit from a neighboring chief, who wanted to know why he and his followers rested on that day. Mackay told him the story of the six days of creation, and how God rested on the seventh day. The chief listened well, and seemed to understand what he was told, but the scripture lesson was a good deal disturbed by the cattle, who took to fighting while it was being given. Mackay wrote, It does seem as if Satan is doing his utmost to prevent even a little gospel light entering this dark land. The natives advised Mackay not to trust Conge, the king, as they were sure he intended to poison him. They told him that after the murder of the missionaries, Smith and O'Neill, he had persuaded their men to lay down their guns, saying that he was their friend, and wished only for peace. They believed him, sat quietly down, and began to cook their food while they were so engaged, Kong's men fell upon them, and many were killed. Mackay felt his position to be one of danger, but it was a cheer to remember that the God whom he served was able to shut the mouth of the lion and that it was not for his own pleasure or profit, but in the service of his Lord and Master. So leaving himself and the whole matter in his hands, he went quietly on, alone, for his men were so overcome with fear, that they begged to be allowed to go to their villages. King Conge, who was at that time little more than twenty years of age, seemed more anxious than before that Mackay should believe his account of the murder of the white men. But when, as a proof of his friendship, Mackay asked for the book in which Lieutenant Smith had been seen writing only a few hours before his death. As he wished to send it to his friends in England, he was told it was lost, and could not be found. He was also told that guns and other things that had belonged to him had been carried away by his people, and he did not know where they were. Mackay replied, Conge says he is a great king, a great king need only tell his people to bring back the articles, and they will soon be here. The king said he would look for them. He then asked a great many questions about England, and expressed surprise on hearing that the subjects of Queen Victoria greatly outnumbered his own. Several days, however, passed, but neither the book nor other lost property were forthcoming. Mackay felt that to wait longer would be a mere waste of valuable time, so after presenting the king with a red blanket and a dressing gown, they wished each other a friendly goodbye. And Mackay returned to where he had left the daisy, and at once began putting her under repair. The natives gave him a warm welcome, and came in crowds to watch the progress of the work. All were good as lookers-on, but had no idea of giving any real help. And as all the heavy part of the work had to be done by his own hands under the rays of a burning sun, a sharp attack of fever again laid him up for some days. Chapter 11. Uganda at last. After many days of very hard work the mission boat, the Daisy, was repaired, and with a glad and praise-filled heart Mackay, in company with a missionary friend, set sail for Uganda. For the first four days everything went smoothly, but on the fifth a terrible storm arose. Heavy seas broke over the little vessel, and the blacks, who formed the crew, were so overcome with fear as to be worse than useless. The daisy was fast filling with water, and there was nothing for it but to let her drift on to a barren and somewhat rocky coast. 
The natives were friendly, brought food, and built a hut to shelter the white men and some of the goods, but the work of repairing the boat had to be done almost all over again. And as the weather continued wet, with frequent storms of rain and thunder, only slow progress was made. After a delay of eight weeks they were afloat again, and after a rough and trying voyage, on November 1, 1878, they came in sight of Entebbe, the port of Uganda. The natives saw them and manned a canoe, beat drums and appeared very pleased to see him. Five days later they reached Rubaga, the capital. King Imtesa was, they were told, too ill to see them, but sent his salams greetings, and two very fat goats as a present. On the 8th Micaiah wrote, this has been an eventful day. Word came this morning that the king was somewhat better, and wished to see us. We, that is, Wilson and I, set off at once, carrying our presents, as everybody seemed too excited to be of any use. Messenger after messenger came running and shouting like so many madmen to hurry us on, but we did not mean to give way, so kept up a steady step. After a long walk we reached the palace, when the gates were opened, and the guard presented arms. We were ushered through long rows of soldiers and attendants to an inner room. At the end of a large hall we found the king, seated upon a mat. He wore a long white robe, something like a dressing gown, and a black coat, richly embroidered with gold thread. He bowed politely, and stools were brought for us to sit upon. Several gaily dressed attendants were seated on the ground, and an old woman, at a little distance behind the king, seemed greatly interested in watching us. For quite ten minutes we just looked at each other in silence, as it would not have been polite for us to speak first. Then a little talk began. We presented our gifts, one being a large musical box, which we set playing, the heavens are telling. He seemed pleased, but after a time said he was too ill to sit longer, and we might retire. The whole court rose when we left, and followed us for some distance, small boys being, as usual, well to the front. In the evening the king sent a present of cattle, tobacco, coffee and honey. Any of our readers who are fond of history will perhaps remember that in Saxon times the smith was considered a very important person, and treated with great respect. Next to him ranked the worker in metal, closely followed by the physician. In the royal court of Wales the smith was allowed to sit with the king and queen in the great hall, at least, so we are told by Dr. Samuel Smiles in a chapter of his interesting book. Industrial Biography, in a chapter all about iron workers and tool makers. From his great skill in all kinds of metalwork, Mackay soon became almost as important as the Saxon smith had been. All kinds of broken articles were brought to him for repair, and the natives were never tired of watching him at his work, and admiring the brightness of the polish he put upon much of it. Native workmen could, it is true, make hoes and hatchets, and a few could even manufacture knife blades, but the art of tempering metals was unknown, and when one day he rolled some logs up an inclined plane. He was followed by a wandering crowd, who shouted, Mackay is the great spirit, yes, he is truly the great spirit. King Imtesa was very intelligent and quick to understand anything that was properly explained to him. Mackay told him about railways, and steamboats, and delighted his majesty by describing the wonders of the telegraph and telephone. One day he said, King Imtesa, my forefathers made the wind their slave, then they put water in the chain, they next enslaved steam, and now the terrible lightning is the white man's slave and a capital one it is too. On another occasion he gave a magic lantern lecture before the king and his court on, the human body, pointing out the wickedness of selling a boy with a body made by God with such wondrous skill and care to an Arab slave trader for a piece of soap. The king paid great attention and said, from this day no slave shall be sold out of my country. Mackay was delighted, and told him it was the best law he had ever made. Busy as Mackay always was, he did not forget that his real object in going to Uganda at all was not so much to make roads, or teach useful arts to the natives, as to carry the glad tidings of salvation through the finished work of Christ to those who had never heard the gospel. In all the haste and bustle of preparation for his journey the printing press that had been the delight of his boyhood had not been forgotten, and he was soon at work translating and printing some short scripture portions. About this time almost every page of his notebook has some such entry as, house, or rather hut, full of boys, who come for a reading lesson, and take a great interest in watching me at my work. A chief, who brought a canoe, spent last night with me. I gave him one of the white blankets off my bed, and we had a long conversation. I tried to tell him as clearly as I could the way of salvation, he asked many questions, and showed a good deal of interest. 
the longer I live among these people, the more I learn to admire, and even to love them. Every Lord's Day Mackay, by royal invitation, went to the palace, when a short gospel service, to which many came, was held. For a time the king showed great interest. On one occasion he was so deeply impressed that he said to his people, I sir, Jesus, was there ever any like him? Mackay rejoiced, and hoped the day was not far distant when Uganda would be ruled by a truly Christian king. But this state of things did not last long. More missionaries were on their way to Uganda. Some of them thinking that to sail for some distance up the Nile, and then across Egypt, would be a quicker and easier way of reaching the country, chose that road. This displeased the king greatly. For some time he had not been on friendly terms with the government of Egypt, and his suspicions were aroused. In vain Mackay assured him that the missionaries were not sent by Queen Victoria or General Gordon, that they did not come to spy out the country, and would not be followed by soldiers who would bring many large guns. The king was frightened and angry, and the outlook was certainly not a bright one. Chapter 12. Dark Days. A few mornings later, as Mackay and a missionary friend were at breakfast, a messenger arrived breathless with haste. The king had called for them. They must go at once. On arriving at the palace, they found his majesty excited and angry. Two white men, Frenchmen, had, he had been told by an Arab trader, landed at the port. Who were they? And what was their object in coming? Were questions he wished to have answered at once. The strangers were Roman Catholic priests, and Mackay explained to the king that though they believed in the one true God, and also in the Lord Jesus, they thought more of the Virgin Mary than of the Lord himself, and prayed not only to God, but to people who had been dead for hundreds of years. They also taught that the Pope was to be obeyed rather than their own king. The king listened, but it was easy to see that he did not understand. He looked bewildered, and said, Who am I to believe? How can I tell which is right? The slave dealers, who disliked Mackay, because he had on more than one occasion exposed their wickedness and done all in his power to put a stop to their trade, lost no opportunity of trying to persuade the king that while pretending to be his friend the white man was really his enemy, and would, sooner or later, bring ships and soldiers and take possession of his country. The Lord's Day that followed must have been a time of more than usual trial. The preaching service could not be held, as the king gave a grand reception to the newly arrived, who made him large and valuable presents, while the beating of drums, firing of guns, and shouting of an excited crowd of onlookers, made it impossible to get a moment's quiet. The priests showed a most unfriendly spirit, and Mackay felt that if they were allowed to remain it might be well for him and his missionary brethren to leave the country. As their preaching was put a stop to, the usefulness hindered, and their lives in danger. The king was ill again, and they were told that should he die, the chiefs intended to kill every foreigner in the country. Still, in spite of difficulties and discouragements, they held on bravely. Going to the palace one Lord's Day morning, Mackay asked the king if he should bring his Bible and read to him. The king said, yes, bring the book. He also asked many questions about the future state and the resurrection of the body. He did not, he said, wish either English, Scotch or French teachers to leave his country. For a short time after this visit things went on more quietly. The preaching services were again held, and the printing press was at work, for as the number of those who wished to be taught to read was increasing, scripture portions and reading sheets were badly wanted. The next serious trouble was with an old woman who said she was a witch and could cure the king of his illness. She saw him very often, and though his health did not improve, Mackay was grieved and disappointed on finding that to please her he had returned to many of his old heathen ways. How I wish I had learned to sew before coming here. Mackay wrote one day in his journal. His clothes were all but worn out, and to dress himself with any degree of respectability was not easy. I had a day at tailoring yesterday, he wrote. A coat of check tweed which one of the Nile party hung up in his hut at night on his way here, was partly eaten, and partly built into the wall before morning by the white ants. He made me a present of the coat, and I have patched and darned till the result is quite a tidy garment but my needlework will not bear a very close inspection. The mission stores were very low indeed. Hardly any barter cloth was left, so as Mackay and his friends were no longer able to buy food, but were obliged to live almost entirely on what the king chose to send. It was decided that he should again go to the coast to bring up supplies. 
taking a few of his boys, he set out with as little delay as possible, but the journey was neither an easy nor a pleasant one. At every village, however small, they were stopped by its chief, who expected tribute or presents of cowries, a small shell, used as money in many parts of Africa, cloth, knives, or beads. At one village B was obliged to wait for many days, as its chief was not content with such things as Mackay was able to give him. But his waiting time was not wasted. He spent much of it in teaching his boys, they in return told him many things he had not known before about the people, their customs, and belief in witchcraft. At almost every stopping place he was surrounded by crowds of women and small boys, who came out to indulge in a long stare at the white man. Sometimes he would take out his musical box, with which they were always delighted. In almost every case their favorite tune was God Save the Queen. Often, when after a long day's march they stopped at some village. His rest was broken by the bitter wail of some mother whose son had been stolen and sold to the Arab slave traders. Kidnapping boys who, when employed as shepherds or goat herds, were often too far away from their own village for their cries to be heard, was, he found, quite a common practice. There were always plenty of traders ready and willing to buy them, in some places hardly a boy was left. How he longed to do something to suppress, even if he could not stop their wicked trade. But at last the object of his long and wearisome journey was gained, he got the needed stores, found porters, and started on his return journey. When still at some distance from Uganda, his three faithful boys narrowly escaped a violent death. While they were sleeping in a hut behind the one in which Mackay, who was again down with fever, lay, some natives with whom they had quarreled during the day rushed in upon them, firing the guns as they entered. The lads fled for their lives and Mackay, though feeling very ill, forced himself to get up, and after some trouble persuaded the leader of the party to sit down and talk to him. Other natives came up, all fully armed. The boys remained in hiding until far into the night when after a long and exhausting debate, Mackay was able to induce the whole party to fire off the guns and go quietly to their homes.